go ahead and pop open a bottle of Castro because Brad Keselowski is back in NASCAR Cup Series victory lane. Justin Allgaier tied his team owner, Dale Earnhardt Jr., in Xfinity Series wins. Ross Chastain smashed a watermelon on Friday night. And Alex Pillow might just be repeating history once again. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. All right, a little bit of house cleaning before we get into the topics for this week. Yeah, the podcast, I didn't really like the iteration of it. So I'm going to turn this more into a 22-minute show, you know, kind of keep it along the same lines as what a television show would be, you know, if they still existed and Race Hub didn't get canceled. So you can basically expect 22 minutes of a recap of what happened over this racing weekend. Try to have a couple different segments in it, and it's going to be a work in progress until we get there. But we're going to start off this week with a recap of what happened this weekend. On Friday night in the NASCAR Truck Series race, we had Ross Chastain win, driving for Nice Motorsport, of course, the team that he helped take to victory lane multiple times a few years ago before he became a big-time NASCAR Cup Series driver. He smashed a watermelon in victory lane and then, well, on the front stretch, rather, and then proceeded to do his TV interview with watermelon seeds still all over his face. Just one time I wish all these drivers who have handlers uh, stand in the background would just come up with a towel and wipe it off. And thankfully, hopefully, maybe, God willing, we don't have to see Fox do another one of those really terrible skits like they did, I believe, last year with the watermelon seed that was on Ross Chastain's face. That was cringe-inducing, to say the least. So he goes on to win the race. It looked like Ty Majeski was about to end Ford's winless streak to start off the 2024 season. That was until a late race caution comes out and sets up a restart, and he ends up not winning the race. On Saturday, you had Justin Allgaier finally get that much-awaited win this season. He goes on to win at Darlington. Justin Allgaier and Darlington go together like Justin Allgaier and Dover, or Justin Allgaier and Phoenix at this point. The guy is just really good there. He gets his 24th NASCAR Xfinity Series win, ties his team owner, Dale Earnhardt Jr., on the all-time wins list, which is pretty cool. I did see a photo of Dale Jr. on Monday morning, and he, Matt Kenseth, and Jimmy Johnson were watching the final laps of Darlington on Dale's phone while walking through the streets of London, a trifecta and a location that you never would have guessed for. On Sunday, you have Brad Keselowski riding his horse to victory lane at Darlington. His first win in 1,117 days. April of 2021 at Talladega with Team Penske is the last time Brad Keselowski was a NASCAR Cup Series winner. And it didn't come without some drama. He, of course, was using that Tom's uh, Castrol Supra throwback from the Super GT Series uh, back in the early 2000s. If you play Gran Turismo, you definitely have played it before. Brad taking a Toyota paint scheme to victory lane is kind of funny. But like I said, there was some drama on Sunday. In the closing laps, there's a restart with about 30 laps to go or so. And Brad enters pit road with the lead exits p2 tyler reddick's team got him off pit road and for a 23 11 pit crew that's a phenomenal job and it looked like tyler reddick who led a career high laps on sunday was going to you know potentially be in a good spot to win this race because it seemed like the leader once they got out front if they could clear him on that restart he was going to be gone well brad and tyler reddick decided to run side by side for what seven eight laps and then the two of them got into the wall off of turn four chris busher back-to-back weeks has an incredible move down the front stretch he didn't split the middle going five wide this time instead he went all the way down to the inside of the track came back up cleared both of them into turns one and two looked like he was about to set sail tyler reddick reels him back in and Reddick gets up alongside of him. Good battle going on. And then Reddick just kind of sends it into three and four, washes up the track. Some fans have been like, oh, well, Busher was already in the wall. Reddick didn't really put him there. Well, he definitely gave him that one two punch to really end the 17th day. Ends up breaking both cars on the contact there. Went into that corner like he was Chase Briscoe at Bristol Dirt. Takes both of them out. Brad Kozlowski inherits the lead. And then he drives on to victory. Gets to do his uh, signature American flag Polish victory lap, which was honestly cool to see. And the career arc of Brad Keselowski is actually remarkable because a decade ago in 2014, he was enemy of the state amongst the Jeff Gordon fans out there and Matt Kenseth fans and basically anybody else that was racing for the championship that year. Because if you remember at Texas, Gordon tries to, you know, win the race. Brad shoots the middle right there, cuts Gordon's tire down, and then Kevin Harvick gives him that little boost in the post-race confrontation where Gordon can grab him by the collar, and then, you know, there is a uh, bit of a hootenanny that happened after that, and they're rolling around on the ground, punching each other. Matt Kenseth chased him down at Charlotte in between the haulers to, to try to beat him up. Brad Keselowski was not a like guy. There was a time where Brad was the villain. I mean, between he and Kyle Busch, they were just kind of wrecking each other every single week. 
And then you throw in the Carl Edwards angle at that. You have the people on Carl's side. You have the people on Brad's side. You had Brad's dad after that gateway crash being like, he ain't going to kill my son. Oh, I agree with you there because Carl definitely sent him a few times. But the career renaissance for Brad Keselowski is actually truly remarkable. It kind of seems like that's how it goes, right? With age, these guys kind of calm down a little bit, and they certainly seemingly turn people around. I mean, at the end of his career, Tony Stewart was a likable guy, and I wouldn't argue that he was always that likable. I mean, even Juan Montoya was likable, and that guy was a dick back in the day. So, yes, the Brad Keselowski career arc, I think, has come to completion. He's now a liked driver, and he's back in victory lane with a team that he co-owns, first driver to do that since Tony Stewart did it at Sonoma in 2016. The rebuild of RFK has been nothing short of an absolute miracle. And I think that's maybe an understatement. He said when he got Matt McCall to come over and crew chief for the car, for the six car form, he said, listen, this is going to suck. It's not going to be fun. And credit to Matt McCall for sticking it out because they went three winless seasons and now he's finally back into victory lane. And listen, you run well enough, eventually you'll find victory lane. And Brad Keselowski was in contention all day. Definitely had, what, a top three car? I think probably most of the day. Everybody would agree with that. And again, kind of the Jimmy Johnson thing. You put yourself in contention enough, you're going to capitalize on a lot of these races and end up winning a lot of them. And Brad did that. He put himself in contention. Yeah, it looked like it maybe faded there when he dropped back to third after uh, Busher got around him and then Reddick was able to clear him. But then, you know, cards played out in his favor. And good for Brad because he ends up going to victory lane. The other race that we had this weekend was the IndyCar Grand Prix at Indianapolis, or the Sancio Grand Prix of Indianapolis. On the road course to start off the month of May, I don't think it's anybody's favorite race. I was in attendance uh, of the race because, hey, listen, if you're going to race at Indianapolis, I'm probably going to be there at, in, at some point. So I think this is the third spring Grand Prix that I've been to. I've been to the fall one, well, the summer one, uh, a couple of times, obviously that one does not exist anymore as well, but it was a great time. And Alex Pillow comes out on top. And once again, history is repeating itself because he did the same thing last year. And then he went on this run at the beginning of the summer and just basically separated himself from the rest of the field. And then all he had to do was just manage that points lead for the rest of the season. And once again, he goes out there and was easily the, probably the best car all day. Uh, Christian Lungard gave it a great run. Christian Lungard had great odds, plus 550. Like, if you were going to bet, like, that was a good bet uh, to take right there. You also had Will Power trying to make some some ground up as well. He was never really able to get past maybe, like, that second or third. Like, it just never seemed like he could gain the same advantage that Polo was getting um, throughout the race. Overall, it was okay. I mean, IndyCar Grand Prix, the Indianapolis road course, is never really great unless you add water to it, and then it becomes a banger most of the time. You also had uh, Santino Ferrucci and Roman Grosjean, the American versus the French, once again, uh, a tale's oldest time. They ran into each other in warm-up. They ran into each other on the track. Somehow, Ferrucci did not get a penalty for that, and the only thing I can assume is because there was not actually any contact made. Whereas Marcus Erickson punted his teammate Colton Herta off the track like he was Pat McAfee, and then he got a penalty for that. Oh, five. Yeah, they had to drop back five positions on track. That's difficult to do. Uh, overall, it was okay. There was one late race caution well, with about 18 laps to go that set up a restart. The entire crowd erupted for that, which was fine, which was great because at to, up to that point, I had gotten pretty strung out for the most part. Windy day at Indianapolis. I got some sunburn on my forearm. Uh, shout out to the merch shop for for selling cold <laughs> cold weather gear because, yeah, we did not go prepared for, for the wind. The wind was brutal on, uh, on Saturday. So overall, great experience of that race. Uh, it was the Indianapolis Grand Prix, right? I don't think you're ever really expecting much unless it rains. But now we get to start off the month of May, starting on Tuesday with Indianapolis 500 practice to carry us into the weekend for qualifying and then into the next weekend for the Indianapolis 500. So that's a bit of a recap of what happened this weekend. New segment for this week is Stephen Wallace's Dumb Move of the Weekend. And for that, we have two this weekend, actually. The first up is Tanner Reef at the Nashville Fairgrounds in the ARC E-Series race. He was attempting to come to pit road, and he ran into the attenuator. That's that's embarrassing. I think Tanner Reef is a good guy. I think he's a decent race car driver. That is not ideal right there. It's the last thing you want to do. It's not as embarrassing as running into the fence, trying to go out for practice, but it is pretty embarrassing 
as well. It will not get replayed as many times as Matt Kenseth running and getting stuck on top of the uh, tires at Dover, but it's it's pretty bad. And then we also have Bobby Timmons, and he posted an onboard of his car, and he got taken out by the safety truck. And I don't mean like kind of got rubbed up a little bit. I mean, the safety truck drove down across the track and T-boned him in the side of his car, put him up, nearly kebobbed him on that light pole. Would have been really bad. Getting taken out by the safety worker is a really bad look for the racetrack. So those were our two Stephen Wallace dumb moves of the weekend. If we have another one next week and I miss it, please tag me in Twitter at BreakHardBlog and let me know what the dumb move was for that weekend. So, of course, the big drama for the weekend came in the NASCAR Cup Series race, and that was between Chris Buescher and Tyler Reddick. Now, like I said, Tyler Reddick went in, he sent it into turns three and four, washed up, hit Buescher, bro broke both of the cars, and then after the race... Busher parks on pit road. Ty Gibbs was in between them, facing the wrong direction. And then Chris Busher was behind him, or Tyler Reddick was behind him. And Tyler Reddick should not have parked that close because Chris Busher got out of the car, turned around, and was like, I hate that guy. So he immediately stormed over there, fuming pissed. He was furious, and he had every right to be because that was a bad, bad job by Tyler Reddick. He goes over, Reddick keeps his helmet on because he's like, this dude's about to beat my ass. And he listened to it, and... Busher's yelling at him, and he was like, essentially what it came down to is, you know, you have a win, I don't have a win. Unintentionally, one of the most funny moments of this entire interaction was Chris Busher, an angry adult man, screaming, you have a sticker, I don't, I don't have that sticker. <laughs> Obviously, it's a win sticker, I know. Uh, some of the people on TikTok in the comments just didn't pick up on the fact that it was a funny line. Obviously, we know the sticker means a win sticker. But just hearing a grown man say, I don't have a sticker, is objectively funny. Um, obviously, Busher wants to get that win, and he has frustration, right? He last he lost last weekend at Kansas by one one thousandth of a second. Not ideal for that. And then this weekend, he has a great shot of winning once again and gets taken out by Tyler Reddick. So back-to-back -back weekends, he could have had, you know, win stickers on his car, and he leaves with none. And then he, you know, is yelling at Reddick, and he's like, I need you to be better. We've always raced each other clean. And Reddick was like, yeah, dude, I get it. I messed up. I, you know, I effed up. I don't care about my car. I'm really sorry. I wrecked your car. This and that. Takes his helmet off. So, you know, um, hats off to Reddick for taking his, his helmet off because I don't think there's a lot of guys that would have done that. And then he stands there. And as the as Busher storms away, the camera just barely catches Reddick reaching into his lip and popping his zen out, which, again, another unintentionally funny moment of the weekend. Uh, the end of that race, though, between that confrontation, there was a man that climbed up on top of the catch fence to watch Brad Keselowski do his burnout underneath him. Very drunk. I was I was very worried for his safety as he climbed up because it also appeared that he was wearing cowboy boots. And I don't personally wear cowboy boots. I look ridiculous in them. But I can imagine that they are not the easiest thing to climb a chain link fence, essentially, in. So he makes it up on top of where the fence starts to curb. He's up there, arms raised, not holding on to anything other than the toes of his boots being hooked into the fence. And Brad Keselowski's going to burn out underneath him. And this guy is loving it. He reminded me of the guy at the Indianapolis 500 last year that was like, these cars are going real fast and real left. We're rolling deep. Woo! That type of thing. That's what this guy was 100%, just the older version of that. That kid at the Indy 500, that he's looking at his future in this gentleman that climbed up on top of the catch fence. I think Fox was attempting to circle the guy that was on the catch fence, and they ended up circling one of the crew members' butts on Brad Kozlowski's team, just caked up. So the end of that race was certainly an interesting thing. And then Fox cuts from the broadcast over to the uh, bowling series. And we didn't get an interview, Josh Berry, who finished P3. Great runs. Ford rumored to have brought some more horsepower to the racetrack this weekend. Doug Yates said they did not. I would argue that they did because they had five cars in the top 10. They looked like they had a ton of speed. Chase Briscoe and Josh Berry, two SHR cars in the top five. Great results for them. Justin Haley on speed in a Rick Ware car gets Rick Ware's first top 10 finish on a non-drafting track. Phenomenal run for those guys. Hats off to everybody at Rick Ware. 
congrats to Rick Ware on putting the money and the resources into that team to become competitive and getting a guy like Justin Haley. Is Justin Haley an A-plus prospect? No, no, I don't think anybody thinks that. But he's a guy that's a really solid race car driver. He can get you results and capitalize when the, the car's there for him. And he did that on Sunday. You also had Michael McDowell rounding out your top 10. Uh, so there's a lot of good runs for a lot of these guys. Uh, once again, great throwback schemes all weekend. Tyler or uh, Terry Labonte was there with Kyle Larson wearing a matching fire suit to Kyle Larson, which I absolutely loved. And then he was in the booth for the what felt like the longest time. So well, we forgot Terry was even, the, even in the booth. And they'd be like, what do you think about that, Terry? And he'd be like, cars are fast. All right. <laughs> I love Terry Labonte. So yeah, the NASCAR Cup Series race this weekend, I gave it an 88. Overall, great weekend of racing. Like I said, we had great racing on Friday night in the Truck Series race. Really felt like Thor Sport has finally maybe turned the corner there for them, which is fantastic. The Xfinity race always delivers. They are phenomenal cars. Going to North Wilkesboro this weekend, I really wish we got to see the NASCAR Xfinity cars on the old surface at North Wilkesboro. That would have been a really good race. And then the Cup Series race delivered. The, the IndyCar race at the Indianapolis Road Course, we know what we're expecting there, right? So nothing too shocking that came out of that. I will say, what are we looking forward to this week? Well, it's about to be the busiest two weeks in racing, honestly. Uh, we have Indy 500 practice opens on Tuesday, high limit on Monday night at Kokomo, Cars Tour at North Wilkesboro on Tuesday and Wednesday night. You have the NASCAR All-Star Race this weekend, NASCAR Trucks this weekend as well at North Wilkesboro, Indianapolis 500 qualifying this weekend, Formula One back in action this weekend as well at Imola, and then next week you have Indianapolis 500 practice, Carb Day, uh, Coke 600 events, uh, qualifying practice, the Xfinity series, as well as Formula One back in Monaco, IndyCar for the Indianapolis 500, and the Coke 600. Kyle Larson's double, the Hendrick 1100, as they've dubbed it. It's going to be a monstrous week going. So to end off the episode here, there's a few things that we should touch on, touch on real quick. Keeping our eye on the dirt racing world, we're really only focused on high limit over here at Brake Car. We don't really talk too much World Outlaws anymore. But on the high limit tour, you had Brad Sweet picking up another win on that tour, as well as Brent Marks this weekend. Brad Sweet has kind of asserted himself as the best guy. Corey Day, if you haven't heard that name, buy stock now because he is about to be the next big thing, has won three races this year. But he's having a real up and down season so far. And the kid's 18, so that's not the biggest shock in the world. But High Limit on Monday night at Kokomo should be an all-timer. They also had an incredibly close finish uh, in High Limit this weekend as well. Because apparently everybody wants to get on the close finish um, on the close finish bandwagon at this point. So excited to see what comes with High Limit going forward. To close off the show here, we'll talk some NASCAR silly season and schedule rumors as we head into 2025 and going forward. Obviously, you guys all saw Michael McDowell signed with Spire this weekend because he wanted some stability in his contract. He didn't want one-year deals, which I think we all can understand that. There's still a ton of things moving on behind the scenes, including potentially all of Stuart Haas Racing being up for sale, which to this point, we had really only heard that their charters were up for sale. Apparently, GM has tested a new body in the wind tunnel for the NASCAR Cup Series. What is it? I asked around and people said they're guarding that secret, you know, harder than the KFC recipe. So I'll, if I figure it out, we'll be making a video on it. And then Jordan Bianchi talked about the 2025 NASCAR Cup Series schedule on The Athletic this week. So a few of the things that he touched on there. NASCAR will be headed international for their first points race since 1958. Where are they headed? Viva La Mexico. They're headed down to... Mexico City at the Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez, the same place the Xfinity Series raced at, the same place that Formula One currently races at as well. Obviously, yes, we know they went international in Japan in the 90s. That wasn't for a points race. This is first race there. Richmond Spring will be losing its date for this Mexico City date. Other things that were talked about. The Clash headed to Bowman Gray, apparently, according to Jordan Bianchi. And as Jeff Gluck touched on on their podcast, the average high in Winston-Salem around the time that the clash is held is 47 degrees. And now people are going to show up, but is it an event where after more than one year will people continue to show up? Who knows? Bowman Gray did some Bowman Gray stuff this weekend as well. It was very WWE-esque. And again, does the Cup Series need to be there? Uh, you could make an argument either way. Facility is actually nice, though. Other things that he talked about, where Coda is expected to be back on the schedule for the fifth year, the NASCAR 
championship weekend. We'll be back in Phoenix in 2025 because, like I said, they sell too many tickets, which is highly unfortunate because it's only 40,000 tickets. It's not like they're selling out the big house or they're selling out Bryant-Denny Stadium every weekend. No, it's 40,000 seats, but it looks good on television and the city embraces it. But apparently the Homestead City Council has agreed to put a bid together essentially to get the NASCAR All-Star or Championship Weekend back in 2026. And God willing, it will move back because that Phoenix race is sleep inducing to say the least. But hopefully optimistic here, maybe the new soft tire that they're using at North Wilkesboro this upcoming week in the All-Star race will be good. And they'll be able to use that on short tracks for the rest of the year and potentially could make Phoenix interesting. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see on that one. Other things he talked about, Montreal appears to be 50-50, and it looks like there will not be a race in Southern California, despite Steve Phelps saying before the season that they will have a race in Southern California in 2025. It looks like they tried to do something at Dodger Stadium with Formula E. That didn't work out. They tried to do something at the Long Beach Grand Prix. That was just never going to happen as long as IndyCar and uh, obviously uh, Jerry Forsythe had their say in it. So yeah, that's kind of where everything stands at at this point. So yeah, let me know in the comments what you think about the new format of the show. Just calling it the break hard show for right now. Plan on doing this once a week. Mondays it'll come out uh, more than likely unless like I really get after it on Sunday evenings. Let me know what you think about that. Let me know what you think about everything that happened this weekend as well. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.